Okay, so we want to continue our discussion about agency contract. And right now we just started into listing agreements. Now, if you remember last night, we um, talked about the different categories of listing agreements, right? Which one of these did we say you always want to do as a broker? Exclusive right to sell. Exclusive right to sell. Why? What does that have to do with? Why is that the preferred one for us? Because no matter who sells it, you're going to get a commission. Well, so yeah, that's a good way of putting it. But you're the only agent. So I know. You're the only firm that represents the seller. That's the exclusive part, right? And furthermore, it doesn't matter who sells the property. It doesn't matter where the buyer comes from. The listing firm is what? Going to go They're going to receive a commission. They're owed a commission, no matter where the buyer comes from. And an exclusive right to sell listing agreement. How about if our firm produces the buyer, do we get paid? Mm -hmm. If another firm produces the buyer, do we get paid? Yeah. If the seller produces the buyer, do yeah. we get paid? That's yes. Fine. Okay. That's the the one you want to do. Okay. Now. The exclusive agency listing, it's got that word exclusive in there, so how many firms are representing the seller? One. one. Still just one. What's the difference between this one and the exclusive right to sell? The, the, seller 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 seller. the seller is basically saying, if I sell it myself, I'm not going to pay you a commission. Yeah. If I produce the buyer, the seller, if I, the seller, produce the buyer, I'm not going to pay you a commission. Can I receive it for that? No. <laughs> no. I told you there's not even a form for this. You literally have to pay an attorney to draft a special form for it. And the owner would have to know right, to ask for that, you know? Well, yeah, they would because, quite honestly, if I go present a listing agreement to somebody, I'm not going to inform them of the existence of anything other than what? The exclusive right, the exclusive right to sell because that's the only one I'm willing to work under. Yeah, if somebody asked me, about these other ones, would I tell them? Sure, yeah. absolutely. But if you know somebody did not ask, I'm not going to volunteer these others exist, nor would I participate in one. Okay? And how about the open listing? We've lost uh, that word exclusive. Listing. So how many firms represent the seller? As many as, they want. as many as they want to hire. And when would a listing firm be owed a commission under an ex under an open? Listing agreement. Whichever agreement. one sells it when they sell it. Whichever one presents a buyer. Yeah. Right? And only if that firm presents if another firm presents a buyer, do we get paid a commission? No. No. If the seller sells themselves, do we get paid a commission? No. No. Okay. So make sure you're familiar with those three types of listing agreements. Now remember I said a protection agreement comes up in what kind of situation? Uh, for, that's right. Yeah. Quinn said, uh, for sale by owners, right? Yes. His bows. Who are we protecting? Ourselves. That's exactly right, ourselves. Why do we have to protect ourselves? We don't need protection agreements if those other listings are in place. Why would we need protection if we're representing a buyer in a FISBO situation? Because the seller normally pays commission and they don't have a real estate. The seller normally pays the commission and that's taken care of in their listing agreement, right? Mm -hmm. And what have they not signed if they're a FISBO? A listing, a listing agreement with anybody. So there's no contract out there that the seller has agreed to pay anybody anything, right? Mm -hmm. So this would be something you would want to establish with the seller prior to doing what? Now, you're not listing it. Prior to what? Prior to showing the house. Remember, this is a case where you represent a buyer, right? And that buyer said to you, I want to see this house over here. It's got that for sale by owner sign in front of it. Folks, the only way you can expect that seller to pay you a commission is if you get them to contractually agree to pay you a commission before you show it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, remember last night, I pointed this out. What if the seller says, I'm not going to sign it, I'm not going to pay you? Can you refuse to show it? No. No. You never refuse to show your client a property. You remind the buyer 
that if they decide to buy this one, they're going to have to pay your commission. And why is it that you can remind them of that, Jesse? It's in their employment contract. It's in their, what, what is their employment contract? We haven't talked about it yet, but what is their employment contract? Um, basically, um, the buyer's agency agreement. There's a buyer agency agreement, just like there's a listing agreement, right? Mm -hmm. So, is it probably a good idea that even though you can have that oral buyer agency thing, that you go ahead and get it put in writing, just in case they want to see something like a FISBA? Yes. Absolutely. Or if they want to see something that's offering you a 1% commission on the buyer side. I'm not worried for 1%. <laughs> 1% of nothing. 1% of a million. I Travis ain't doing it. No way. So I'm guessing that contract typically has that protection agreement already. What contract? For the buyer agency, exclusive buyer agency. So buyer agency is not going to have a, you mean this protection agreement? Yeah. No. The protection agreement is an agreement between the firm representing the buyer and the seller who doesn't have representation at all. The protection agreement has nothing to do with the buyer themselves. It's an agreement that you go out and get as a, as a buyer agency, as a firm representing a buyer. You go out and you get this agreement with the seller that says, I have a, it basically says, I have a buyer who's interested in your property. I want to show your property. You agree that if I show your property and my buyer makes you an offer, you're going to pay us this commission in exchange for representing the buyer, for bringing the buyer to you in this transaction. Does that make sense? If he says no, then we have to rely on our buyer agency agreement. Because essentially what a buyer agency agreement says is, we will always try to get paid first by who? The seller. But you agree, Mr. Buyer, that if we can't get paid by the seller, it's just not tough luck for us that you're going to make sure we get paid. That ultimately, the person responsible for making sure we get paid is you, the buyer. So you have two choices when it comes to purchasing a property. You can either purchase a property that is going to pay our fee, our commission, right? Or you can purchase any property you want and understand that you will pay the fee or the difference between what they pay us and the fee, whatever it may be. But ultimately, who's on the hook for paying a buyer's agent? The buyer. buyer is. Even though 99% of the time, who ends up paying? The seller. The seller. Does everybody understand that relationship and how it works? So essentially in a protection agreement, what you're asking the seller to do is pay you to work against them. Right? Which is pretty much what they're always doing when they sign a listing agreement. Yes, they're, they're hiring somebody to represent them, but they're also agreeing that that listing commission can be split with a buyer's representative, right? So pretty much in every transaction, a seller is agreeing to pay some money to the people working against them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, I'm just going to point this out. I don't want it to confuse you. I debate whether I should say it or not, but just from a commonsensical approach, we say the seller always pays the commissions, right? Now, I know in the collapse of the last few years, every once in a while it happened that a seller brought a check to closing. But most of the time, who's the one bringing a check to the closing table? The, the buyer is the one bringing the money, right? And so we can say the seller's paying the commission all till we're blue in the face, but ultimately all the money comes from who? The, the buyer, buyer, right? I mean, that's but just a common sense of the, the sale price. It comes from the sales price. But where's the whole sales price coming from? The buyer. Oh, there you but go. But it goes to the seller and then the seller. No, it does not go to the seller. Well, they never see it. But it goes on a piece of paper. And it shows up in a column that's allocated to the seller on a piece of paper. But in the real world, would that seller be willing to take $20,000 less if they didn't have to pay $20,000 in commission? Correct. Sure they would. They don't care. So I'm just pointing out to you that if you have a buyer, and here's why I point that out to you, because it's going to help you in the real world when you have one of these situations where the buyer wants to buy that FISBO and they get all mad at you because they have to pay a commission. Here's what you say to them. 
Mr. Smith, you were paying my commission all along. Just previously, it was rolled into the sales price. And you never saw that you were paying my commission, right? Because we said the seller, so, but you don't think the seller took that into consideration when they priced their house? Of course they did. They're not stupid, right? So now, the only difference is you have to negotiate this price lower to account for the commission, just like they had to list it higher to account for the commission. At the end of the day, is a buyer going to pay any more for a FISBO because they got to add our commission on than they would for one that was listed by another company? No. It's just how it, it, it's a shell game, folks. It's shuffling the money around, right? Does that make sense from a, a just a, a common sense standpoint? Now, on a test, who pays the commission? Uh, the seller does. And and the reason we show it that way is because the seller is normally the one that we're giving this big stack of money, so it's easiest to take it from them, right? The buyer's already got forty bazillion charges on there. They would flip out if we put another one in their column, even if it didn't matter in the grand scheme of things. We just don't want to put anything else in the side. We do it because that's where the least pain is. That's why we do it that way. Okay? Everybody got me on that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you know what a protection agreement is? Yes. Okay. What is this fee for services thing that's up here? MLS. It's like MLS what? I'm paying for what? For them to list it for them. They had to list it for them, and that's what all these do, right? Single service. Yeah. It's like a a la carte, right? And, and a, a la carte, I pick what I want. Instead of, so think of an exclusive right to sell listing as that's full service, right? Like you go to a you go to a five star hotel, that's full service. I mean they 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 valet park your car, they take your bags out of the car, they take them up to the room, they you know they do everything for you, right? They include a massage down at the spa, every, you know it's all in. You got champagne in the room when you check, but do you pay more for that when you check out? Yeah. Yes. Are there inevitably going to be some parts of that service that you probably could do without? Like you could park your own car, or you don't really like champagne, or I don't want to go to the spa. That's just kind of weird having people <laughs> sand down my toenail. I don't want to do that. Right. Inevitably, there's going to be some things that you're just like, eh, I don't do much for me. Right. So this fee for services thing is a way where people, instead of buying the full service version and paying the most for it, can pick and choose what parts of it they do want. And what's the part of it they do want most often? MLS. They want it in the MLS. They want it in MLS. And you can do that as a listing broker. But what's the key to doing that as a listing broker? Because that's required by the law, right? The point here is there are certain things that you can't discount away. You can't say, well, the only thing they paid me for was putting it in my list. They didn't pay me to go over there and measure it. They didn't pay me to go check it out and make sure we were disclosing all the material facts. Because the real estate commission says, you got to do that whether you get paid for it or not. Does that make sense? That's what we're saying with this minimum level of service. The real estate commission says, there is a minimum level of service that any listing broker, even a fee for services or a la carte type setup, is required to give. Okay? Good with that? All right. So those were the different types of listing agreements we talked about last night. Um, in your book, they kind of give you an idea of some of the things you would need to know when you place properties in the MLS. The, the purpose of the MLS is to get greater exposure, number one, for your listings. And number two, it's a place to share listings. Without the MLS, we as brokers wouldn't have any way to sort of share all our listings in one centralized place. We can go search one place and find everything that's listed. Who owns the MLS? The Association of Realtors. The Association of Realtors owns the multiple listing service. Okay? So if you want to have access to the multiple listing service, you're going to have to join the Association of Realtors. Um, so there are lots of things that you need to know when it comes to listing a property in there, but none of them are going to be tested. So don't spend time studying about information needed when you list a property in the MLS. Know what the MLS is, know who owns it, know what its purpose is. But don't study these bullet points about stuff you need to put in the MLS. Okay?
right? Because most of these we're going to cover anyway when we talk about the listing agreements and the buyer agency agreements and the sales contracts, things that need to be there. Okay? All right. So how do we terminate listings on page 189 in the textbook? Um, the best way to terminate a listing is to fulfill the purpose of the listing, like any other contract. Remember last night we talked about fulfillment of a contract was the best way to terminate the contract? Well, this is a contract too, right? So the best way to terminate it is to fulfill the purpose. What is the purpose of a listing agreement? Sell the home. So the best way to, to terminate a listing is to sell it. Absolutely. Um, expiration. That's a big one. I like that. Why is that a big one? Because North Carolina state law and real estate commission rules say that every agency agreement, which would be a listing, buyer agency, property management, must all have what? An expiration date on them. You cannot have what we call open-ended listings. By mutual consent, any contract can be terminated from mutual assent. That just means the parties agree, right? By breach of one of the parties. One of the two parties has breached the contract. That'd be a way to terminate a listing. That would make it voidable. What does that mean? It could void it. Don't say it that way. Because void has a very special meaning, right? Void means it never was a contract. What does voidable mean? Not enforceable in court. Not enforceable in court. Only anybody? It means one person breached it. It means one person breached it, so what? It was once valid. It used to be valid, which means it was enforceable in a court of law. Keep talking. You ain't got there yet. That's all I would say. The person who didn't breach it. The person who who didn't breach it can hold the other one, but the person who breached it can't hold the second party. That is correct. So voidable means it used to be enforceable on how many parties? Two. 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 How many is it enforceable on now? One. One, because the other one has breached, right? So, enforceable on the one that did the breaching or the one that didn't do anything wrong? The it's enforceable on the one who did the breaching. It's the one who didn't do anything wrong that can walk away, folks. It's still enforceable on the one who did the breach. It's not enforceable on the one who was damaged, the one who didn't do anything wrong. Everybody got that? You need to repeat it over and over and over to yourself because until you get it, you won't have voidable down. Okay? Here in the book, it says that that whole contract was a minor. Okay. Who was damaged in a contract with a minor? The minor. The minor was damaged. So he's not the one breaching or he is the one breaching? No. He's not the one breaching the contract. How can somebody who can't consent to a contract breach the contract? Who's breaching the contract when they make a contract with a minor? The one trying to make the person. The one trying to make the contract with the minor. The adult, they're the one breaching the law, contract law in North Carolina, right? So that's a void contract. And who's option? Who can, who can terminate that contract? The minor. minor can. Who can still be held liable for that contract? The adult. The adult. So I've seen, like, on the test, and I'm looking at it right here also, it says when a minor reaches the age of 18, a minor can disaffirm the contract. So what does that mean basically? Um, so basically they get a do-over at the once they hit 18. Mm -hmm. If they hit, hit 18 while they're under contract, okay, let's say we sign a sales contract, they're buying a house mm -hmm. and they're 17 and 12, 11 months, right? Mm -hmm. Is it enforceable on them at the point in time they sign it? No, no because they've not reached the age of what? 18. 18. So that is a voidable contract. So when they hit 18, is it voidable? When they hit 18, they either have to do one of two things. Either terminate it okay. or affirm it. And affirm it means do anything that means that moves them further toward closing it. So they have the option of doing it? Or what if 
the landlord said, hey, were you 18? I get out. Hmm? All right, now <laughs> you got to give me more detail than that. I don't understand. I see the question like that on the test, but they didn't have many options. It was just like, is, is unenforceable? Is he, I can't remember, but it just didn't have an option that I would have chose. Like, okay. So well, first of all, back up. Okay. Could the landlord a situation? And then the landlord is the adult. Okay. Could the landlord ever say do anything? No. Right. And that's because they're not the one in control. Okay. Who's the one in control in a contract with a minor? The minor. The minor, the minor is. Okay. The adult is the dumbass that signed a contract with a minor. They don't get any benefit of a doubt here, folks. A judge is going to look at them and say, the hell is wrong with you? Now I'm confused. So if you're 17, you legally cannot buy a house. No, that okay. is not what I said. Oh. <laughs> I said, I, like, okay. I spent an hour last night. Standing right here I thought and I said it. that oh, unenforceable, yeah. voidable, valid, it don't matter because you can always do what? Close. Close. So is there any way that you can tell anybody that they can't buy a house? No. No. If they show up with money and somebody else shows up with a deed, can they buy a house? Yes. 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 There ain't no special rule that says this group of people cannot do this. No. The question here in contract law is, would a judge in a court in North Carolina hold these parties responsible for what they signed saying they would do? No. Okay? Yeah. That's what it means to be enforceable. Would a judge hold them responsible for this agreement? And in the case of a minor, would the judge hold them responsible for what they said they would do? No. no. Would the judge hold the adult responsible for what they said they would do? Yeah. Yes. So when you have a contract where it is enforceable on one party, but not the other party, what is the word for that? Voidable. So a contract with a minor is a what kind of contract? Voidable. It's a voidable contract. And it's voidable at whose control? The minor's the control, not the adult, because the minor is the one that's been damaged. They are the one who have been infringed on by being, t they've been taken advantage of by this mean adult, right? So to your question, Jesse, what, why does the age of 18 matter once they're under contract? Because here's the thing, once they hit 18, they can't keep moving toward closing and then say, Oh, well, I was only 17 when I signed that contract. If they do anything after the age of 18 that moves them closer to closing, that's them saying to the world, I still understand what I signed. I, you know, clearly, I meant to be bound by that thing because I'm still working toward closing it. So, I'm bound to it. That's what they're saying to the world. That's what affirming that contract means, right? So, what, you know, what things could consist of affirming a contract by a minor? Well, I'll give you an example of credit card bill. Credit card companies have been known to issue credit cards to people who are not 18 years old. It's happened before, right? I did too. I had them in high school. They don't do it anymore, but I had them in high school. Now, I wish I had known contract law back then because when I was 17 years old and the day before I turned 18, I could have literally written a letter to them that said, I didn't know what I was signing. I don't owe you anything. And legally, they could not have enforced any of those cardholder agreements, nor could they have held me responsible for that debt. But the day I turn 18 and I make a credit card payment, what have I done? I have affirmed that contract. Is it valid now? Absolutely. Same thing in a real estate sales contract. If they go out and contract to buy a house when they're 17 and a half to build a house, until they're 18, what can they do? Walk away at any time. But once they turn 18, if they don't go and say, like, immediately, I didn't know what I was doing, and they even they make one phone call to the builder and says, hey, when's our inspection? That's affirming the contract, because that's clearly stating they know what's going on, they know what they signed, they know what they're headed toward, now they're buying. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Okay. So please don't confuse that voidable, unenforceable, void even, with the ability to close. We can always close. Now, there's never any restriction on somebody not being able to close a contract. They can do it.
Okay, and don't use that terminology of voiding a contract because that's a bad mindset to be in. There's no such thing as voiding a contract. That does not exist. It is thing, it's dumb for us to say it. I know we say it in the real world, but legally that's not the correct way to say it. What do we do to a contract to end it? Terminate. We terminate a contract. Void contracts are what? Unenforceable on either party. Unenforceable on either party. Why? No, now they've not both breached. They were never what? They never were a contract. There was no contract to breach. They ne void means it never was. Void means it never existed. That's the drug deal. That's the drug deal. That's a void contract because the, it didn't meet that definition of a contract. It was for an illegal act, right? So that's a void contract. The reason the minor thing is not void, it's not for a legal act, an illegal act, right? There's nothing illegal about a minor purchasing, right? It's just not enforceable on both parties because of the minor. Yes. Is that specifically North Carolina? Is what specifically North Carolina? Uh, the age of consent laws? That is legal. No, not legal, but yeah, that is not illegal for a 17 to buy animals or close on animals. Um, you know, I really can't answer that question specifically. I mean, every state has different laws of consent, but I can't imagine states having property law that don't allow minors to own property. That'd be really problematic for estates in particular. You know, I mean, what do you, what would you do then if somebody's parents were killed when they were five years old? If you say they can't own property, I mean, obviously they got to have a custodian, but still, they own it, right? You know, so I, I can't imagine there are states that say you can't own property if you're under this age. I mean, in general, if somebody shows up with the money, somebody else shows up with the deed. You know, it's all cool. we're gonna close. Okay. You know? Okay. Um, the, the one you were looking for, Megan, was unenforceable. That's a contract where they both breached. Okay. A, a contract where both parties have breached the contract is an unenforceable contract. The difference between unenforceable and void, because they're both not enforceable on both parties, right? Mm -hmm. The difference is unenforceable did used to be a contract. It was at one point valid. Mm -hmm. And then the two parties both breached it and it became unenforceable as a result of that. Void never was. Okay. That's why I don't want you to get in the habit of using that terminology, oh, it's voidable so he can void it. No, it's not right. It's voidable so he can what? Terminate. Terminate. Okay. So can a 17-year-old sell a house? That one is much more tricky. Um, the answer in general is yes, in general. However, um, it probably is going to have to get approval of a court somewhere for them to sell that property because, you know, you can sort of take back buying something because you can always sell it again. It's hard to take back selling it, right? Because you can't force somebody to sell it back to you, right? So there generally are more legal roadblocks in the way buyer actually selling a piece of property than there are to them buying property. Okay. Uh, Operation of law, it means a court can terminate uh, a listing agreement. Destruction or condemnation of the property. Condemnation means what's happened. The state. The state, government, city, town did what? They took, the they took the property. What do we call that process? That legal idea is what? Eminent domain. So condemnation is the process of taking it. Eminent domain is the idea that they can take it, right? Right? Or death or incapacity of either party. Now, who are the parties to a listing agreement? The seller. seller and the firm. the firm. So with death of a broker, this is something they might ask you on a test. No. Death of a broker terminate a listing agreement. No. Unless the broker is the only broker in the firm, right? Mm -hmm. And then that would be death of the firm. Right. But gener generally speaking, death of the broker would have no impact on a listing agreement because the party is not the broker, it's the Firm. Okay, everybody good on that? Okay, so that's how we terminate listings. Now, the next uh, three, four pages here, actually about five pages, um, 
deals with specifically the North Carolina form, the North Carolina listing agreement. I will tell you that on Thursday night, we are going to go over line by line the listing agreement and the buyer agency agreement. Okay? It, it, it is tedious. I understand that. Number one, the real estate commission says it's probably probably the most useful thing you'll get in the whole class from a real world perspective. Because the first thing you're going to need if you want to go make some money is the form that gets you hired to make some money, right? And that's a listing agreement or a buyer agency agreement, okay? So Thursday night, you will get copies of those documents and we'll go over them line by line. Now tonight, I want to talk to you about some things that the Real Estate Commission says have to be by you or that other guy. I don't, know. I don't know. I really don't know. I don't know what the schedule is for this week. I don't know what your schedule is on mine. I don't know. Okay. All right. So we need an agency disclosure. Okay. And if on the next two pages, three pages, four pages. That in North Carolina shows up on pretty much every paragraph out in the margin, doesn't it? This is all specific to our state, folks. These are all North Carolina Real Estate Commission rules about things that must show up in the listing agreements. Now, what listing agreement do you think we're going to go over Thursday night? The one that comes from where? The North Carolina Association of Realtors, because those are the most common forms, okay? We're going to go over the standard listing agreement, the exclusive right to sell listing agreement from the North Carolina Association of Realtors. Okay, so things that have to be there. Um, the agency disclosure. What do we give people to disclose our agency relationship? Working with, working with real estate agents. That's what we give them. And so the, one of the first things in the listing agreement that the Real Estate Commission says is it has to be some mention of that document saying that they have already gotten it at that point. So if you're at the point of filling out this form and you haven't already gone over the Working with Real Estate Agents brochure, what should you do? Stop and go over the Working with Real Estate Agents brochure. It is impossible to sign a listing agreement before you go over the Working with Real Estate Agents brochure. Okay, um, That's got to be there. You've got to have the names of the parties, obviously, and they're going to be the seller and the listing firm. You need a description of the property. What kind of description? A legal description. A legal description. What is the most likely type of legal description you're going to find in a listing agreement? In North Carolina, in this particular one, no, that is not the most likely one you're going to find. The address and description. You are likely to find the address, but that is that is an informal description. I want the most likely. See, this is where you've lost yourself in chapter four. That little tiny chapter with nothing in it. Yes, that reference to a plat map. That's the most likely legal description you're going to find. In a listing agreement, because it's much shorter than meets and bounds, right? So somewhere in there, you're going to need either meets and bounds or hopefully that reference to a recorded plat map description of the property. Okay? You need the term of the listing agreement on the bottom of page 190. As I said, all written agency agreements must specify a definite termination date. It goes on to say, if the property has not been sold by midnight of the termination date, the listing agreement is automatically terminated without notification being required. So what does that mean if that date's automatic and it's written in the stone? What is it? What, 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 what's that contract terminology for something like that? Time is of the essence. Time is of the essence on that date. It does. Good. Okay. Um, the listing price, remember folks, this is a contract to get you paid, to get your firm paid, right? So the contract's got to set out under what conditions you get paid. Well, it's fancy to say we produce a ready, willing, and able buyer at terms acceptable to the seller. But how do we know what terms are acceptable to the seller? They tell us. 
Well, what else? We put, it in the we put it in this listing agreement. That list price you put in that listing agreement is very important because how else do you know when you've actually earned your commission, right? So basically what we're saying here, if somebody brings you an offer that meets what they've listed it for and they won't accept it, have you earned your commission? Yes. Absolutely. If they listed it $250 and I bring them a full price $250 offer and they refuse to sign it, folks, I have done what they hired me to do. Does that make sense? Do they owe a commission? Does that mean we're necessarily going to collect one? Because we'd have to do it where? In court. In court. Trust me, that will get around fast. We start suing clients. I did see it happen one time. I re actually recommended the agent. They filed a lawsuit one time. It was not with a seller. It was actually with a buyer. And they did win. And they got the commission. But that was because the buyer lied to them. Commission. They bought from somebody else. They, no. Actually, what they did was they, they went under contract. This, this lady, broker, had represented their children. Um, about two years later, parents moved down here to be close to grandkids and that whole deal. Wanted to be in the same neighborhood with the daughter. Um, she ends up representing the parents as well. She's good friends with the daughter. She ends up representing the parents. There's no houses in the daughter's neighborhood for sale. There is a house in the neighborhood next door for sale. They like it. They go under contract on it. They put a $10,000 earnest money deposit down. Three days before closing, they call her and they tell her they're backing out of the deal. They don't give her any further explanation. She tells them, you're going to have to forfeit your $10,000 earnest money deposit. They say, yep, we know. We're fine. Release it to them. And she says, are you sure? And they say, that's exactly what we want to do. And we're just not interested in buying anything else. Thank you for all your help. Sorry it didn't work out. That's what they told her. Well, about six months after that, she runs into the daughter. who's a friend of hers. And they're, you know, talking, and and she says, you know, well, how are you, mom and dad? Oh, they're doing great. They love the new house. That's what the daughter said. What had happened was the daughter was having a party at her home, and apparently was telling her friends, yeah, mom and dad are moving down here. They're buying a house next week, right next door in the neighborhood. And the neighbors across the street said, I wish we had known you were in the market because we're about to put our house on the market. And, you know, we would have sold our house to you. We just, you know, we get ready to list our house. We would have sold it to you. And um, we could have saved that 6% commission if we, we had sold it to you. Now, this is a $500,000 neighborhood. How much is a 6% commission in $500,000? $30,000, right? So the buyer said to the seller, have you listed it already? And said, no, we're getting ready to sign the paperwork tomorrow. I said, listen, we love this neighborhood and we love your house. We've been in your house before. You're going to save $30,000 in commissions if you don't list it. We'll buy it from you. You sell it to us for $15,000 less than what you were going to list it for, and we'll buy it from you. They looked at it as they were saving fifteen dollars to lose ten, dollars right? The seller is perfectly happy because to them, selling it for thirty dollars less in list price if they don't pay a commission is exactly the same as getting full price if they did pay a commission. And so they bought the house across the street. And she found out about it. And she asked me, what should I do? I'd sue them. So how much did she get? She got what her contract called for, which was 2.5% of the purchase price of the one that they terminated, which was five hundred and twenty-six dollars she and the daughter are not the same uh, Probably not. So she got about, she got about 13, 14 grand. Or her firm did. Would that be 10 realty? No. I was going to say, is that why you told her to no, do no, 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 no. No. Sure, but when she had to sue them, would the firm help her with It's the firm suing them. Okay, that's what I was going to say. She, she, had to she was a broker in charge commission. of her own. She was a broker in charge of her own firm. Okay. She was her own firm. So for her, it was her suing them because she was her own firm. But in a big firm, you'd have to convince the broker in charge to file it. Now, could she have convinced you? Yeah, in that case, because they were completely dishonest about it. Because here's the thing, if she had come, if they had come to her and told them why they wanted to terminate, what was going on, she probably could have negotiated to get some of that earnest money to find back. She probably could have helped them on that thing. And she probably could have still represented them in, you know, buying 
the other one and, and would have probably taken a cut on the commission to get them in the house they wanted to. In other words, she could have roughly worked it out where they were about the same, you know, uh, if they had been honest about it. But they never, she never got that chance. Okay? Um, so we need that listing price because that's what we've been hired to sell it for. Um, our fee. It's important that our fee show up in the listing agreement, folks, or in our agency agreement. Why is it important that that show up there? Because that's, that's the only contract where it can show up, right? Remember I said one of the big rules about sales contracts is what cannot be there. Any Anything about paying brokers or real estate firms, right? Because the brokers or real estate firms are not parties to that contract. So this is where our fee has to show up. This is our contract. This is our employment contract. Okay? Notice it says that the brokerage fee must be freely negotiable between the parties. Therefore, it cannot be pre-printed on a standard form. To comply with federal antitrust laws, real estate brokers cannot state or imply that the brokerage fee is set by law, by MLS, by a board of realtors, nor can they state it as the standard or customary fee. It also says in here, and this is an important one, it says that the, the, the listing agreement should address this idea of additional compensation. Is there any other money that we're going to get paid by any other sources here? Let me explain to you how that might happen. Lots of times, sellers end up buying a home warranty for the transaction. Give the buyer a one-year home warranty. Some home warranty companies pay you a fee for setting up that warranty. It might be 50 bucks. But guess who's got to know about that 50 bucks? The seller, your client. You have to disclose it to them. So if there's any other money you're getting paid other than what your fee on that agreement is, you've got to disclose it to your client. So. Are there any other standard or... The ones where that might happen? Yeah, I mean, home, home warranty makes sense. Not, not on the seller side, but there's lots of them on the buyer side. Bonuses and, you know, just all kinds of stuff on the buyer side. Cruises and iPads and... From the firm? Uh, no, not from the firm. It would be from builders, like from the party. seller side. Sometimes you'll see, a, you know, like a listing from a builder that says, you know, the, it's a 3% commission plus a cruise to the Bahamas. <laughs> so when you, you've got to disclose that to that buyer that not only are you getting the commission, but you're also getting cruise to the Bahamas, you know. You know, are you getting an iPad or you getting you know, whatever. And that's not as common right now because sellers don't have to do all that stuff to get it sold because stuff just sells now. But you know, back in two thousand nine when you couldn't move anything, the builders were doing everything they could, you know, to to put incentives on these things to get them sold. Because we know agents would never intentionally try to steer their client toward a property that had such a bonus on it, right? You know, you would never go to that new construction home that had a $10,000 bonus on it. Um, we would never, ever, ever do things like that, right? And you should, honestly. It's not worth it. It really isn't, you know? If, if that, I, so here's what I, here's what I do. I try not to even look at the commissions until my clients actually become interested in the thing. And if they become interested in it, then I look down there and see if there's anything I need to disclose to them. You know, how do you disclose it to them? In writing, in I email, I'd send them an email and say, FYI, on our buyer agency agreement, we agreed that we would be paid 2.5 percent of the sales price. Well, this particular property, they're offering three percent, or they're offering 2.5 percent plus an iPad as a bonus. I didn't even know they were offering the bonus when I showed you the property, which is true because I don't look. I honestly don't, you know, and I, I don't care about the iPad, but I want you to know so that you don't feel later on that I steered you to this property okay. because there was an iPad involved. And I you just tell them in an email. That's right. We need to close one time because I'm going to the Bahamas right after you close. <laughs> All right. Um, the authority to cooperate with other firms down here at the bottom. So, and I'm going to back up to that old right extender clause. I know I skipped it. Just accidentally, no purpose behind that. It doesn't matter. I'll go back to it. 
the authority to cooperate with other firms. What other firms are we cooperating with? What other real estate firms will we cooperate with as a listing firm? Uh, the buyer side. The buyer side, right? With the seller you sub know, agent. You know, <laughs> absolutely. That, the seller sub agent side. If we were given, if we were given, we could give firms permission to to work as seller sub agents, right? So what would you, if you check that box that says cooperate with sub agents of the seller? What would you be giving permission? What would the, the seller be giving you permission to do as a listing firm? Allow other people to come in their house. Allow other people from other firms mm -hmm. to do what? Show their home. To show their home to buyers, right? Mm -hmm. But would those other firms represent those buyers? No. no. Who would they be representing? The seller. So essentially what the seller would be given permission here is for any real estate firm to bring a buyer and actually represent the seller in the transaction. Why might that be dangerous? This responsibility thing works both ways, folks. Just like we are responsible for the naughty things that our clients do in transactions, if we don't attempt to stop them or fix them, our clients are responsible for things we do that are wrong in transactions. So if a, if a if somebody authorizes seller sub agency, right? And they say we will cooperate with other firms. Now we're not talking about our firm, you know. Obviously everybody in our firm is a sub agent and seller, right? We're talking about cooperating with outside firms who have these brokers who have buyers. And the buyers dislike that agent so much they wouldn't hire them to represent them. But we will let them come in and represent you in this transaction. And you're going to be held legally responsible for anything they say, even though we don't even know who the heck they are. Does that sound like it could be a little bit dangerous for your seller right there? Absolutely. So does that sound like something you would probably want to authorize if you were a seller? No. Shake your head. So are you going to check that box when you fill out a listing agreement? Shut your head. When you put one in the MLS and there's a box there that says commission to sub-agents, what are you going to put in that box? No. No or zero. Okay? You follow my drift? You're not going to authorize seller sub-agency, folks. It makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense. From a legal standpoint, it's stupid. It's like saying, I don't know who in the hell you are, but you can come represent me if you'll bring me a buyer. Who does that? What kind of outside firms do we want to cooperate with? Buyer firms. Firms that represent the buyer. Would we want to have our seller authorize that activity? Absolutely, because we would want other firms who have buyers to be able to come and bring us an offer. So not only are they authorizing us to work with that firm, they're additionally authorizing us to do what with that firm? Sure. Pay them. Pay them. Remember, they've already said they're going to pay us, right? Mm -hmm. They're paying us that total listing commission up there, that 7% or 6% or 5%, whatever it is that you've negotiated with that seller. They're going, they've already authorized paying that amount of money, right? What are they authorizing here? When they check that box that says we authorize you to cooperate with outside firms that represent the buyer, what are they authorizing you to do? Split, the Split that total commission with that outside firm that represents the buyer. Is that in addition to the six or seven or five no. percent? No. No, it's coming out of that five, six, seven percent listing. Commission. Does that make sense? If you're, they're authorizing you to split it with another firm who represents the buyer. Does that make sense? Everybody good on that? Now, I want you to back up to this protection period, which is on page 192. Put in your notes. That's the extender clause. The extender clause. We said every listing agreement has to have what kind of date in it? Termination. Termination date. Well, this thing sort of extends that termination date. Basically, what the extender clause or the protection period says is, and here's what it's designed to prevent. If I got my house listed and I list it for three months with a real estate firm, and then 
on the day before it's supposed to expire, a buyer brings me an offer. Do I really want to necessarily act on that offer right now? What would I rather do? Huh? Hold out and then call them back. Hold out and call them back. Why? Because then we can split the difference. We just split the difference and not pay the commission, right? If things supposed to expire tomorrow, I'm paying them 7%. Why the hell would I want to sign this offer now? I just wait for tomorrow. If I wait for tomorrow, sign the offer, who do I not have to pay? The broker. That's what this thing's there to prevent. So what this extender clause says is, Yes, this agreement is expired. Any new buyers, you don't owe us a commission for. But anybody who viewed the property or became interested in the property, that we can prove they became interested in the property while we had it listed, you still owe us a commission for that person. Does that make sense? Does everybody follow that? Now, it ain't as perfect as it sounds. There's a big gotcha in here. You got to prove it. Number one, you got to prove it. That ain't the biggest gotcha. The biggest one is this thing is only in play if they don't hire another real estate firm. If they do hire another real estate firm, would you be owed a commission? No. no. Who would be owed a commission? The new firm. It's only designed to prevent them from paying, to avoid paying a commission. If they hire a new firm, wouldn't that suck? Man, you go ahead and thing listed for six months, and on the last day you get an offer in, and they wait for it to expire, and the new I firm the next day goes on a contract on the first day, and they hadn't even put the sign up, and they get paid. Does everybody understand how this works? Okay, So it's only good if what? If they don't do what? Hire a new firm. That's the only way this is in play, if they don't hire a new firm. All right, let's take a break.